This presentation is delivered by the Stanford Center for Professional Development. Welcome everybody to the Stanford Seminar on People, Computers, and Design. Uh, today we have Bill Griswold and uh, today, a lot of us take for granted the fact that we have a mobile device that has location-aware services. Bill was one of the very first researchers to ever start exploring this work. And so for more than a decade now, Bill's been involved in ubiquitous computing research, looking at things like uh, the Active Campus, which provided location-aware services at his home in UCSD. Uh, and more recently, he's been working on environmental sensing and sensor networks. Uh, Bill has also done a lot of research at the intersection of HCI and software engineering. Uh, I think he's been, in, in many ways, a real leading systems researcher who cares about user experience issues. And so we're very lucky to have Bill here today. Thank you very much, Scott. It's a pleasure to be here to talk to you uh, today, and I'm going to be telling you about our participatory air quality system, uh, CitiSense. So about three years ago, I was at a conference uh, and found uh, this on my doorstep outside my hotel room. And I was just shocked, and I said, oh my god, you know, what can I do about that? You know, this sounds, this sounds really bad. And I went and did a little additional research and found out it's, it's actually a uh, it's, a, it's a pretty dire issue. So uh, by federal air quality standards, over half of Americans experience uh, uh, unacceptable air quality levels in their, in their counties uh, every year. Uh, so for example, it's known that in the city of Chula Vista near San Diego, there are an additional 140 cancer cases per million residents due to air pollution. This air pollution is primarily truck and auto pollution. And there are particulates, benzene, sulfur, uh, sulfur dioxide, formaldehyde, lots of things you don't feel like you should be encountering every, as an everyday experience, but it's there in our air. You keep looking a little bit further, and you find out that asthma uh, as, a, as an event, an asthma attack, is our, they're 50% higher near highways. And what's, what's, what's really shocking is 30% of all US schools are actually near highways uh, by population health standards, about I think 400 meters. Uh, and not surprisingly, with uh, uh, demographics like that, there are over a million respiratory, reported respiratory events annually in children. So I'll give you an idea of the magnitude of this, uh, this issue. On top of that, there's ongoing research right now that is uh, uh, teaching us that it's not just chronic exposures of pollution that gradually build up your body or clog up your lungs or give you cancer, that they're actually dangerous to peak exposure. So uh, during a, a, a high pollution day, there are increased hospital admissions for asthma, uh, for um, uh, cardiac events and things like that, and actually increased deaths. So these are actually measurable consequences of you know, a peak pollution day. Okay. Now, that's, this isn't even regulated today uh, in the United States, but eventually it, it could be as we learn more about it. So uh, how, does, how does this break down for the federal government? What are they doing about it? Well, in San Diego County, it's a big county, 4,000 square miles. We have over 3 million residents. And to keep track of the air quality for these people, we have 10 sensors. Okay. These sensors are not located predominantly where people live or commute. They're located in places that it's possible to install a big, heavy, expensive sensor and keep it secured and calibrated and things like that. It's meant to capture sort of regional, sort of basin air, air quality, but it doesn't really tell us that much about exposure. That's sort of uh, a little bit of a mystery uh, today. <clears throat> so if the government can't do it, I believe that we can. And by we, I mean citizens and computer scientists, because citizens are plentiful, and, the com and we can put computers on them, uh, cheap computers on them, to monitor uh, uh, air quality and ultimately exposure. So here's my vision. We have this uh, woman, Lisa, here. Uh, and uh, she's, uh, here she is uh, in La Jolla, near UCSD. And she's thinking about going running later, but she's an asthmatic. So uh, she, could, she could look at the EPA data, go pull this stuff down from the EPA, 
But as you see, there are no air quality monitors on this map. So nothing that could really inform her, her decisions about whether today's a good day to run, where she's planning to run. So OK, let's drop a little personal sensor on her and have it Bluetooth to her phone and give her a display like this. Well, that's great. So now she knows something about what's going on right now. But what about somewhere else in town a little bit later in the day? She's still, st still a little bit of a mystery. Well, OK, let's put, let's put those boards on more people, uh, on more cell phones uh, in, the, in the region. And let's we can share that into the internet, combine it with that EPA data. And then we can compute a, a precise, detailed map of air pollution somewhere else later in the day. Okay? So that's, that's the idea. And now we can actually start to plan our, uh, Lisa can start to plan her run. Once we have that, we can share that information with public health practitioners, the press, and your doctor if they have any time after their five minutes a year with you. So this is an idea long in coming, actually. Back in 1998, David Brin, the, uh, the science fiction writer, wrote this wonderful book called The Transparent Society. And he envisioned this coming age of sensors. Uh, and what he noted is that at, at the time, that the people who had these things were law enforcement and Walmart, but normal people weren't carrying these things around. And, but he asked, who's watching the watchers? And he thought that everyone should be carrying these sensors to kind of level the playing field and give everyone that opportunity. So he sort of, I think, anticipated this age of pervasive sensing, citizen sensing. In 2001, we got Wikipedia, which is a citizen encyclopedia, where we can start to tell the history the way we want it to be told, the way we believe it, not how World Book believes it or Encyclopedia Britannica believes it. Uh, in 2007, a colleague of mine introduced something called the wireless traffic report, so people could text their location and a traffic event. You could start to see it on a map. Again, it's an aggregating of, of citizen data for, for personal action. And then Shannon Spanicky, at the same time, developed this little thing called Squirrel, which is a carbon monoxide monitor, which uh, Bluetooth to your cute little 2007 flip phone, uh, and provided artistic displays on the phone and also to large public displays. Uh, she's a media artist. Uh, and that was, this is actually the work that inspired CitizenSense. As a computer scientist, I, I extrapolated what she was doing. I said, wow, that's really incredible. You know, I think we should do this at a really big scale. Uh, Shannon now works for the city of San Francisco on, on similar issues, which is, which is really cool. And then later uh, came uh, Deborah Estrin and, and the SENS group, which developed the idea of participatory sensing. Here an example is this, uh, their peer project, Personalized Estimates of Environmental Exposure and Impact, which use your location and EPA data and other ways of estimating to give you an estimate of your exposure and your uh, pollution footprint. It's, uh, but the only local sensing is really the GPS, your location, or a zip code. So the question is, how can we enable participatory sensing? But it's more than that. We want it to be always on, available to us all the time. Uh, and so we're getting data from wherever we go, okay, wherever we're doing. And we want it to be real time, because we want to be able to act on it in the moment. And we want it everywhere, always on, uh, in real time. So how can we do that? So this is a challenging problem. The types of sensors we're talking about, sensors that are affordable, are they're noisy. They have small errors in them. Uh, the location that's recorded by the GPS could be off a little bit. Uh, and they're in, and as whatever density we can deploy these things at, it's not infinitely dense, it's going to be sparse. A lot less sparse than the EPA sensors, but still there needs to be some spatial and temporal interpolation. Uh, we have a mobile power problem. To have these things all the time is probably going to consume a lot of power somewhere in the system. This is, these are not temporary, sometimes on, uh, campaign-based, oh, well, let's do it for this afternoon. We're talking about all the time. We're going to need an extensible software architecture, an adaptable software architecture, and adapt to the local conditions to manage power and other uh, services in an adaptable way to the context to provide the right information. There's security and privacy implications, and there's questions of medical efficacy. This is what uh, my colleagues and I are working on. I've been focusing on the HCI component. Uh, and this is funded by NSF and a cyber physical systems project. 
we've been taking on this constellation of issues in Citizens. So that's the background. And the rest of this talk, I'm going to tell you about the Citizens system, about uh, how we do that machine learning interpolation, and spatial temporal interpolation with noise. And we're going to talk about the power considerations. Uh, and then I'll tell you about a user study we've done uh, uh, with commuters at UCSD that sheds light on how a system like this changes the way people uh, think and behave about air pollution. So the, the, uh, the one component of CitiSense is this board here. I have it right here. It just doesn't work. I dropped it. Uh, and uh, it's got an 8-bit processor, some flash and RAM, EEPROM. It's got a Bluetooth module for Bluetoothing to the phone. It has onboard temperature, humidity, and barometric pressure uh, sensors. And it has three electrochemical gas sensors, carbon monoxide, NO2, and ozone. And we chose those because they're relatively independent of each other in terms of uh, their sources. And so it allows us to uh, maximize their benefit and, and infer what other pollutants are probably in the area if these are, if these are present. This is work uh, by the hardware's work of Piero Zappi, who is a postdoc at UCSD, now at Qualcomm. And the app is primarily due to Nima Nixod, my PhD student. So to tell you a little bit about the app here, it's an Android application. It has this at-a-glance view that displays uh, the EPA's uh, AQI, Air Quality Index. It's a simplified uh, version of measures for air pollution that uh, basically ignores the source of the pollution and just maps it into a consequence. Uh, and then it gives you a nice color system, a number system, and then a color system so they can at a glance say that's good, that's bad. And to help the user, we have this uh, bar here that shows you where you are in that progression and reminds you. All right. We also have some social sharing buttons I'll talk about later. But if you, you know, tap this screen, you can drill down in the details, you can see what the offending pollutant is, the parts per million, you can get a graph of your exposure for the day. Uh, and, uh, and then, of course, you know, tap again and you're back home again. Okay. So uh, th those are the two primary uh, uh, on-body components. The phone connects to, the phone connects to a back-end server, which aggregates all this data where the machine learning is going to happen. It also provides these personal maps to show you where you've been that day, uh, what exposures you got, and also what your exposures were out through the, through the day. Uh, a bit on the phone, like on the phone, but in much more detail. There's nothing special about the back end. It's a rather you know, generic you know, web technology. So let me talk about the machine learning component a little bit. So we have this spatial and temporal sparseness. There's, there's uh, noise in the sensors and in the GPS. Uh, and what we want to be able to do is, uh, is learn a, an accurate as possible representation of the pollution at all points in space and time. What we do is we learn a correlation of, of the sensor values we're gathering uh, and correlate that also with location and time. We then do a, what's called a latent variable factorization, which basically exposes real underlying hidden variables, if you will. We do a kernel-based Gaussian regression over those latent variables. And then when that's done, we translate it back to the variables that we understand. Uh, as an example, uh, here is uh, uh, temperature data from the Central Valley. Temperature is really important for farming, so that's, they have a lot of sensors out there. And there are actually some sensors over here that are failing. And our machine learning system can actually detect that and fill those values in and compute a much more accurate uh, temperature gradient uh, for the region. So how does this look inside CitiSense? Uh, new, relatively new to the system, we're able to uh, compute these overlays for uh, a, por a portion of San Diego. And you can see here that there's some green good areas here and then there's some yellow areas that are you know, around the highway corridor that are uh, representing sort of moderate air pollution and not, and not so good. So how do we keep this thing on all the time? The key thing we've been looking at is reducing the redundancy of the sensory, of the data gathering. When you're gathering readings every six seconds, there's going to be a lot of uh, readings that are essentially identical. And this can come in, uh, and so that's going to look something like that. 
And we get a lot of readings like that. Where do these come from? Well, if you're in the same location, uh, the pollution is changing relatively slowly over time unless a truck drives by or something like that. It tends to change gradually throughout the day. A lot of stability. We could downsample for that. The other situation is where you have two people who are traveling on the same route. And so they're not fixed in space, but two people are, are, are sort of locked together in space as they move together. And so we can also uh, undersample for that. So how do we take advantage of that? Well, we have Mark here who's all by himself someplace. His battery is full. He can do full sampling. We throw in uh, Lisa, uh, who also has a full battery, and we can interleave their sampling and save a good amount of sampling energy. If her battery runs low, we can shift the load back to Mark. Makes perfect sense, right? So if you do this in simulation, you can actually save a lot in, in a lot of power in running the sensor. But there's a catch. We need to equate the locations of these people fairly accurately. And that means we need to communicate either between them or back to a server to deter detect the locality to then downsample the, uh, uh, the sampling. And that consumes a lot of energy. Because it turns out that communications is a huge power consumer uh, in these sort of applications. So this doesn't actually work. So we took another shot at redundancy and looked at the redundancy of the readings on the phone with respect to the model that we're computing on the server. We said, if the model's really accurate, the server doesn't need to know about it. Right? So, so what we do is we take a, a portion of the global model that's local to you, we upload it to the phone, and the phone monitors the samples it's getting relative to the model within some error epsilon. And then if they get out of band, the phone's like, ooh, I have new exciting data here. Uh, let's upload it to the server and let it crank on it and compute a better model. Of course, the other reason the readings might be out of band is that the new model has been computed, but we haven't transmitted to the phone yet, because again, we're not really being aggressive about the communications. So you first update the model, see if that helps. If that doesn't, you know, then compute a new model and upload that model. And so this kind of lazy approach. Uh, with this approach, we can save a lot in the communication cost between 28 and 80% depending on the motion profile and the value we compute for epsilon, how much error we're willing to tolerate in the difference between the readings and the model. Really, really, really cool idea, I thought. I was, I was really, uh, really impressed by this result. I had nothing to do with it. Um, so, uh, so with that in mind, so that's kind of the system view of it. It's like, well, how does, how does this matter? So uh, uh, what we did is we conducted an exploratory field study conducted primarily by my student, Liz Bales, with help from Nicole Quick, who was in the School of Medicine at the time. And we wanted to explore questions like, how do people respond to having a system like Citizen? So we're not talking about unhealthy people. We're talking about people who are of typical, typical health and abilities, but you know, had this sort of capability on them. We want to look at how it affected their awareness and how it affected their behavior, and how did it affect their communities? How, did, how was that relationship uh, with their friends and their community, how was that altered or shifted? So to get at this, we, looked, uh, we recruited commuters at UCSD. These are people who are producing air pollution to a certain degree, at least the ones who are driving cars or taking the bus, uh, and also are consumers of it because they're on the roads at times where there's a lot of traffic. Uh, so uh, we gave, um, uh, we uh, recruited 16 healthy adults. We had them carry the, the board and a dedicated phone for a month. So we didn't have them use their own phone. We just gave them one of ours. Uh, carry it for one month. And we asked that these, we expected these commuters to be commuting fairly far, you know, more than 20 minute commutes each way. So si sizable commutes. We also asked that they be regular users of Facebook because we have this uh, Facebook communication capability to look at the social networking aspects of it. Okay. Their demographics, eight males, eight females, ages 20 to 56, average age of 38, so not a young group. Uh, they, uh, they had actually rather long commutes, uh, average of um, 36 miles round trip and uh, a wide variety of backgrounds and no professors. 
Uh, so it's uh, people, typical backgrounds. There's even a, a painter, you know, people who they paint, paint buildings, paint rooms, and things like that. They also had a wide variety of commuting styles. And this was intentional on our part. This was a, meant to be an exploratory study. It's like, what happens? What do people do? And we thought that the varying backgrounds of people might influence the way they think about and react to and reason about air pollution. So we had people who cycle, walk, uh, bus, uh, car, um, train, go, just go went from a lot of lot of variation there. Okay, this is just a sampling of the fir, of, of eight of the subjects. For these subjects, we had a pre-study, mid-study, and end-of-study questionnaire, and then we had an open-ended interview at the end of the study to discuss with them. And of course, we had all their citizens data. We gave them the the phone and the board with those capabilities we talked about earlier. In addition the uh, Facebook capability so that if when they uh, post to Facebook, it would take the data that's on the server actually uh, and uh, provide a link to that map that I showed you earlier, a, a somewhat um, privatized version of that map, so that their friends could see where they'd been for the last several hours and what the pollution uh, profile was and things like that. We had tried a purely textual uh, communication on Facebook, but people couldn't get a good sense of the location, and of course it didn't give a sense of their whole day. So, there, so this, this map was really you know, critical to the communication. Uh, and we also made available on the phone this chart to remind them uh, what these different levels of exposure meant in terms of their health, 0 to 50 being good, and all the way up through 300 and above, which is extremely hazardous. Okay. That's the, uh, the map I talked about earlier. So, uh, so here's an example of one commuter's exposure. They're uh, actually biking through here from work to home. You can see it's really good on the left. It peaks as they're crossing the highway. They reach another peak over here because there's another highway right over here that you can't see. And then it drops down as they uh, progress to their home. So we started to analyze uh, their data. We first looked at the initial stages of discovery and a growing awareness of the air pollution around them. Uh, many of the users referred to CitiSense as a sixth sense. And when I saw that, I told my student Liz, that's a great you know, starting title for our paper. She said, sorry, Bill. Everyone's already used it about a half dozen times. It's taken. And I said, well, what about a seventh sense or an eighth sense? We've got to do something here. She said, no, sorry. <laughs> that was kind of disappointing. But people did talk about it in that. And, and what it really speaks to is this, uh, uh, we've made the invisible visible to them. Something that they couldn't see before that they could see now. And that's what they really meant by this sixth sense idea. So for example, participant four talked about, I'm pleasantly surprised that the quality of air around my work and home environment is generally high. Uh, another said, it never occurred to me how bad the air is as cars drive by while I'm waiting for the bus. Uh, and P6 said, I've become more aware of how things like freeways, power plants, et cetera, affect the surrounding area. I always just thought of the atmosphere as being evenly mixed, but it is not. And this, this, this was a recurrent theme you know, mentioned here as well, that, that the user's general misconception was that the air pollution was relatively evenly distributed. And if you look at the EPA maps, that they, they provide on a daily basis that are updated hourly, that's what they look like. But that's not actually what people are, are living in and experiencing, and our, our system shows that, uh, show that, shows that, shows that difference. And so here now that our users understood that the pollution they're experiencing was different in different places and times. And we also began to see some really interesting sense-making activities. Uh, 13 out of 16 of our participants sought out possible causes for the air pollution that they were seeing. So for example, P9 said, I always see a spike in the, in the uh, air quality values when I arrive at UCSD. I think it's when I walk through an area where several of the city buses are stopped and running. We've had that second mention of the bus stop and it's going to come up a couple of more times. Uh, uh, and what we found for, for these participants that the real-time nature of the readings was crucial. That is that they would see something, uh, a pollution, possible pollution source, or they'd be glancing at their phone, and it would merely say, hey, what's, uh, what's going on here? And they would, whatever piece was missing, they'd look for it. So if they saw a pollution source, they'd get out their phone. If they had their phone, they'd start looking around for a pollution source. So the real-time aspects were really important. 
Another thing that was uh, really important was the glanceable design of the display. That we, we just t we're just telling them by color and by number, good, not so good, pretty bad, really awful. They didn't have to worry about the pollution source or what parts per million went or anything like that. So it freed them up cognitively to look around and think about what's going on in their environment rather than doing math in their heads. So for example, P16 said, for the most part, I looked at it and it was in the green, so it wasn't too bad. P11 said, walking up to the Triton, the pollutants were at 250-ish for quite a few days. Or, uh, few, few days. What's over there? So we hear the, the use of green and the, these numbers. They've totally abstracted away what the pollutant is and the values. They just talk about these things naturally uh, as, as sort of being native. Uh, obviously, this, uh, this sort of reasoning led to people to question their assumptions and ultimately revise their mental models about what pollution would likely look like, look like in their environment you know, when they weren't constantly glancing at the phone. And ultimately, it became a foundation for behavior change. So uh, we actually had feared that when people would see this information that they would become despondent. It's like, oh my god, you know, look at this you know, terrible pollution. You know, I'm dying. And you know, truth be told, San Diego has relatively clean air. And these are middle class people who live in relatively you know, air clean neighborhoods. So that really wasn't to be a concern. But what was really interesting is that people took this information and they started using their inferences to modify their behavior. They started avoiding, bu avoiding busy streets when walking. They'd, instead of walking down the main thoroughfare, they'd go one street over. They would back up from the, from the street at the bus stop and back up 20 yards because the pollution was a lot lower there. They would, uh, the people who commuted on the train would stand back from the engine. They'd stand more towards the back of the train or something like that. Uh, one uh, one uh, subject asked their employer for new air filters in their workplace. Uh, and P10 said something like, uh, oh, well, so this is actually interesting. This is, a, again, a workplace uh, uh, issue. Um, this was a, a student who worked in an electrical engineering lab where they were doing soldering. And uh, uh, what the people who are doing the soldering now moved their soldering out outdoors uh, into the hallway. Um, so that they would vent to the outdoors instead of collect, uh, collect indoors. And uh, P6 said, I'm more conscious of leaving my car idling and keeping the windows closed on the freeway. Uh, again, one is the idling maybe not affecting them so directly. It's something they're doing for everybody. Uh, but another thing that people had noticed is that if they roll their windows down in the car, that the pollution exposure seemed to be higher. The change in awareness also led to attitude changes. So P8 said, I try to keep abreast of environmental issues. And this has definitely opened my eyes. The potential to bring awareness to the public is always key. This is a, a reference back to this making the invisible visible again, is that once we can make this invisible thing tangible, people respond to it in a completely different way and could actually change the way people think. Another interesting thing we observed was that the importance of, that these were personal mobile sensors that they carried in their bodies, that they weren't installed static sensor or fixed sensors in the environment. And in particular, uh, these types of sensors would normally be installed in public places, but not in the home and maybe not in the workplace. So P6 said, it seems like my gas stove kicks out carbon monoxide and it isn't vented. That concerns me. Another talked about the use of incense. And uh, this is the, uh, this is the uh, soldering uh, uh, fellow again. Anywhere where you're working with electrical equipment or chemicals, like the air quality seems fine, but the readings say otherwise. And so we can see that the ability to carry this into your place and see it as your exposure rather than computing uh, pollution in the environment, which is interesting but not connected to you, is kind of a different, is a different experience and different quality. It's actually different data. So the other thing we noticed is that there's a hyper-local quality to this information. So the people who commuted uh, in carpools or on trains reported things like this. I share the readings on the train and elsewhere, and they're usually interested. They seem, like me, surprised at the difference near freeways. And, um, uh, and, and what we found is that, the, that there was this conversation making that happened around the device and the readings 
in part because they're visible, but in part because it was my exposure is your exposure if we're in the same car, the same train. And to us it felt like, this is like the way people talk about the weather or sports or you know, other things that are happening in our daily lives. These are things that people could share and talk about freely because it was you know, in their environment and part of their daily lives. The other interesting thing is that the Facebook interactions uh, uh, were often, and discussions were often with people who lived close to you and traveled similar routes to you. And in fact, they, the Facebook conversations were often just conversation starters for face-to-face -face conversations. So P14 said, the Facebook posts to me were a jumping off point. When I would see someone in real life, they would bring it up. So we see this bringing back to the fa this face-to-face -face element. And uh, referring back to, as Scott mentioned earlier, my active campus work, my active campus work, I was, I was trying to change the dynamics I saw with mobile phones, where everyone is talking into a phone and not paying attention to what they're doing, or they're texting and bumping into things. I wanted active campus to cause you to look up and say, oh, there. I have a friend nearby. Oh, well, there's this interesting talk. Oh, there's that restaurant that I was looking for. That's what I wanted to happen with Active Campus. And completely accidentally, we discovered this is what CitiSense does. That, that because it's, it's happening right here, right now, in my personal environment, others around me are interested in, and this is information about my immediate, envir immediate environment. So it causes me to look up, look for what's happening around me, and then to talk to people who are around me, and those people are interested in the data as well. So we start to see, maybe, I hope, a new class of applications that uh, mobile applications that connect people to their environments rather than separate them and take them out of those environments. Another interesting observation was that we had many people traveling on the same commute routes but actually having rather different exposures. We had people riding on bikes who had these you know, rather high pollution readings and then people in cars who didn't. And it's because of the rolled up windows and the cabin air filters that uh, modern cars have now changes you know, what, what's experienced inside the car if you have the windows rolled up. And we also, the same thing, that the people riding the bus are experiencing these buses pulling in and pulling out constantly, you know, especially when they hit the gas. It's just you know, this big gas cloud. And they're, the, they're taking the brunt of it even though they're doing something to reduce the pollution in the area by riding the bus instead of driving a car. The biker is reducing the air pollution, but is the greater uh, recipient of the air pollution. So tragically, those who are doing the most to clean the air are paying a price for that. And there's kind of a disparities quality to this data as well, is that the people who ride buses are generally less wealthy than the people who are driving an Alexis to work. The people who are biking uh, may not have a car and may not have that choice available to them. So there's this theme in ubiquitous computing about who pays for the technology and who benefits. And we often see an asymmetry there and we're seeing that again here in this, in this hyperlocal context. And it may point to barriers in actually further cleaning up the air because a lot of the people with the political power is like, air pollution? What air pollution? And it's the poor bikers and bus riders who continue to pay the price. What it meant for us, though, is that it, it highlights the potential of participatory systems like CitiSense to expose these disparities and cause a discussion about them. So although CitiSense didn't directly convey this data, we didn't allow, we didn't display other people's data, you know, for each other to see. We saw this in the thing. Um, some users discovered it anyway because some days they bike, some days they drive, uh, some stand at the bus stop, you know, some stand back from the bus, they experiment. They discovered this for themselves. But in redesigning this system, uh, or in, in extending the design system, which in fact we've already done in, in, in more recent studies, we want to display other people's data and have people question, you know, why are they seeing different data than the other people on the road. So to summarize, we, we, uh, through this making the invisible visible, we've exposed numerous misconceptions that people had about air pollution. Sometimes they thought they had bad air pollution and it was good. Other times it was the other way around. There's this general notion of uniformity, whether it's in space and time, and even individual. I must have the same pollution as that pollution. Not so. Uh, we also uh, uh, expose this 
this interesting data that indoor air pollution is kind of a problem. I mean, this the EPA knows this, scientists know this, but these people got to see this firsthand, uh, and and another misconception uh, was dispelled. We also saw that real time at a glance displays enabled uh, important sense making and actually let people take action, even if in a small way, to take control of their health and their air pollution exposure. They were able to identify sources, uh, change their behaviors, and talk to other people around them about it and start a discussion that could ultimately lead to uh, some sort of uh, political change. And finally, this, uh, this thing I just talked about of that this is data that, uh, that um, uh, connect, connects people to the world around them and to the people around them and the people around them back to them. Uh, was a really interesting idea. And to me, it suggests a new class of UBICOMP systems or way of thinking about design of UBICOMP systems to maintain and recreate that engagement rather than destroy it, as we've done so far. So to conclude, I'd like to observe that by capturing personal air quality in real time, citizens can give, give people a measure of control over their lives. By making the invisible visible, people can change their awareness, their attitudes, and ultimately their, their behavior. More broadly, we see that participatory sensing can address problems that are beyond the reach of, in, reach of institutions, whether it's personally or uh, hopefully at some point at the political level. There's several contributions uh, that I've highlighted today, a particular uh, hardware software system design with our board, the phone, and the back end server with the machine learning components showed how we can use machine learning to infer air quality everywhere for everyone. So that's not just the people carrying the boards, but anyone with a mobile phone or access to a web browser can now see what the air pollution is likely like uh, where they are or where their friends are. We talked a bit about power management to prolong battery life, to allow an always on real time system. And uh, an interaction design that supports sense making these, uh, uh, appropriating this EPA uh, AQI system was really effective at creating at-a-glance displays so that the people could do sense making rather than uh, math in their heads. And then finally, out of that, we see, see, saw these new patterns of sense making, behavior change, attitudinal change, and sharing. So, any questions? How's your 16 ready of the smokers? Ah, you know, I don't. Because I think you get a big, you know, when you light up, the thing changes. Yeah, I'm guessing the answer is no, because I think it would have shown up in the paper, right? I'd have to ask Liz. You know, we got a lot of interviews, but I think I think the answer is no. That was because the user. There was the mention of the, the, the per person who burned incense. You know, I think that's <laughs> kind of as close as we got to. Maybe they're smokers, but weren't so open to talking about it. Yeah, yeah this is in San Francisco. Yeah. Sort of along the same lines, going back to traditional uh, sensing systems, uh, besides coming up with good modeling and data aggregation, two, two of the really hard parts are one, guaranteeing communication, and the other one is fixturing in terms of guaranteeing the, the, the proper situation of the sensor within its environment. So mm -hmm. these spurious influences don't hold sway. So right. I'm thinking in your, in your case, uh, I guess maybe half of your little boxes are in purses. So how much are they sensing Revlon and Sh Shiseido instead of and, and crosstalk with CO sensors? Right. Like so when we gave, uh, they these have little straps on the back, uh, Velcro straps. And when we we talked to our users, said, you know, please mount this on the outside. You know, they put it out, attach it to their purse or to their backpacks or something like that. It might have ended up in the purse. Uh, it is, and it, even when you're doing that, there's some interesting consequences. So for example, when you're in a car with the windows rolled up, you're getting a measure of exposure inside the cabin of the car. It's not telling you what the pollution is outside the car. And so our maps are, in some sense, exposure maps. They're not uh, pollution in the air maps. They're different than they're different than the EPA's maps. It's certainly possible. We haven't, we haven't done it. You can think of it, it's, it's, uh, it's a source of error, if you will. Uh, but uh, you could use a, a variety of things. There are a lot of UBICOMP techniques for detecting, oh, I'm traveling at this speed, or indoor-outdoor. There's light, light characteristics, sound characteristics, um, you know, lack of movement for long periods of time. You could use 
Uh, Google knows a lot about the built infrastructure now. So there are lots of things that can be done. It'd still be, you know, obviously, um, you know, subject to error, but at least we could start labeling the data with indoor, outdoor, uh, and then you could actually flip a switch and say, show me indoor, show me, or show me exposure, show me estimated pollution levels. Uh, but we, we don't have that right now. We just have these um, exposure maps. And if you look at that uh, closely at that map I showed you earlier, you see UCSD looks greener than the roads around it. And part of that is that people spend most of their time indoors at UCSD. And so we're actually, again, looking at exposure, not uh, the, the latent pollution levels. Um, so it's, but it's an important part for the machine learning to actually be able to label our data with, that, with this uh, additional context. Yeah. Do you find that any of the, for example, the bikers who commute outside change their actual routes to avoid high or low air quality areas or anything like that? Well, we, we heard from people who were walkers that they would go one road over and walk. And those are probably people who lived in uh, these, um, you know, Manhattan-style roads where they can make adjustments. A lot of the commute paths into UCSD, you really don't have a lot of choices. Uh, it's more of a hub-and-spoke type of system. Uh, but, you know, the, the data says no. But they certainly would have liked to. I think the implications for behavior change are really fascinating. And I'm wondering if it is known or if you know anything about um, sort of margin of consequence. So how big a difference in air quality actually should I care about? OK, it's cute, but whoa, if a difference of five is just noise, a difference of 50, mm, maybe I want to do something. Um, I wonder if you have any kind of index of that sort. Right. We did not train our users or educate our users about this. And in fact, not that much is known. So that, that there's a difference between, for example, chronic exposure, which is sort of a buildup over decades, and that's something for me to worry about having grown up in New Jersey, uh, and uh, versus peak exposures, which sensitive populations are very sensitive to and lead to hospital admissions. Uh, and so um, uh, we did not educate people on it. We just used the AQI system. By the way, something to note that we um, appropriate the AQI system, but didn't call it AQI. We call it MEQI, My Instantaneous AQI. AQI is really an, uh, an hourly average measure of pollution in an area, whereas what we're collecting is instantaneous and is much more spiky and could probably, you know, could very likely come out to the averages that um, uh, the EPA estimates, except that uh, it's really about where people spend their time uh, so if they're spending a lot of time on the highways, it's going to be much higher than the EPA would estimate. If they spend their t all their time indoors, it could actually be much lower. And so we, we actually call it, used to call it AQI, now we call it this MI AQI. Just even if understanding whether it's more valuable to avoid uh, short but wild spikes versus uh, you know, any of that kind of... For different people, it's going to be different. Yeah. So I have a new research project called Delphi which is looking at the data mining aspect of this. It's essentially a database project. We're going to be merging medical records, personal health data like weigh-ins, genomic data, environmental data. So we can start to say, for you, peak exposure bad. For you, chronic exposure bad. And try to unravel all of that. But it's going to be, that's going to be a, it's a super big data question that you know, we won't have our head around probably for another decade or so. Incidentally, really solved one of the original problems you set out, which was that the EPA machines were huge and really expensive. They seem really cheap, and you could mount them on cell phone towers all around the city. Uh, how hard do you think that, would, that kind of thing would be to push on? Right. So um, there are multiple aspects to this. So the fixturing, que fixturing question was mentioned earlier. And the EPA devices are, are sort of well fixtured to do high quality sampling, if not in the right place. Um, getting them in the right place compromises a lot of that. Also, our sensors are relatively low quality. You know, the voltages in the board aren't precise all the time because it's battery powered. They're cheap. Um, they need to be calibrated every six months. Um, I'm sure the EPA sensors are calibrated more often than that uh, just because they want to get it right. Uh, uh, but certainly some people, some cities are doing this now. I know New York City is doing uh, fine grain sampling. An interesting thing though is, is that the reason that EPA sampling happens now is to regulate highway funding. Too much pollution, no highway funding. So the air quality districts that do the monitoring do not have a lot of incentive to do high quality, high density, 
monitoring, they would prefer the, average, the numbers be really average and kind of low. So it really, this is where it comes back to sort of citizen action. And I think some cities are, you know, as opposed to counties, are kind of taking control of this. Probably New York City doesn't get a lot of highway data. Um, I mean, sorry, highway funding. So, uh, uh, so there's, there's some tensions here, but it's, it's certainly possible. I mean, you could put these, you could fix these devices and put solar panels on them. You could install them in mail trucks or cabs. You can have sensitive populations carry them because I think asthmatics, elderly, and high-performing athletes would all be interested in this data. There are a lot of interesting scenarios, and we don't know how it's going to play out. Another thing we don't know is that it really we're ultimately looking at ecology of devices and sensors, because I'm also going to be wearing a Go Wear that does my heart rate stuff and something for, um, uh, you know, diet and you know weight and all these sort of things. So we're going to have a lot of devices, a lot of them consuming power. What is going to be the hub that all that data goes through? Is it going to be my cell phone or something else? Am I going to have two data plans? You know, it's kind of these are all open questions. What do you, I mean, building on Dora's question, what do you see as real opportunities for uh, changing either human behavior or policy? Like, um, if I can't bike by another route, uh, is it worth collecting the data? Or for the bikers who do cross the highway, do you, do you tell them put on a face mask? And then at, at, the, at the policy level, uh, I'm sure you've thought about something along the lines of automatically mail my congressperson when I cross under the stinky highway. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's, you know, you don't know how these things unfold, right? Because you don't know where the real pain points are and where the real power points are. Uh, we're going to start looking at a community south of San Diego called San Ysidro, which is right on the border with Tijuana. It's in the United States, right at the border. There are two highways that converge there. And there's traffic backed up on both sides trying to get the border. And you have all these idling trucks, a lot of trucks. Although most of the trucks are actually one stop over um, a, few, a, couple, a, a mile down the road. But it's, just, it's really awful. And uh, San Ysidro just had this new school built for them that is right in the heart of this pollution spot. It's one of these schools that's right next to a highway. And uh, uh, it's going to be interesting to see what this community can do. They've already recruited San Diego State University, uh, our, our sister university, to do air quality sampling for them and try to change the policies at the border to reduce the idling vehicles and all of that. It's just not clear, you know, what, you know, there's a, is it a federal issue? Is it a local issue? How is it going to, um, it's, it's really hard to say. And I think it's, um, it's going to be very interesting, interesting to see. You know, I've talked to a couple of EPA people at, at meetings like this, but I haven't gone to my local air quality district and said, ah, can we talk? Uh, but that's sort of now that we have the fully running system, you know, we're able to do that. And uh, it'll be interesting to see how that side of the discussion unfolds. Yeah. Can you talk a uh, little more on the personal? Uh, you, you said about policy issues about EPA. I mean, uh, my fear is that if you have some sensor like this and you're biking usually and it tells you it's not good for you, then you'll rather stop biking, right? Which is the opposite of what you would want, right? So I'm wondering what are the little nudges that we can have to make this work in the right direction? So yeah, yeah. I mean, it's the, it's. I mean, it really reminds me of the other half of Scott's question, uh, which is there, there could be the reaction like, oh, I'm not taking the bus anymore. It'll be worth it for me to buy a car with a good cabin air filter. And it's like, oh, no. Um, uh, and, uh, but I think you know, we have to look really hard at this. You can't you know, suppress the data, right? Because it's sort of not what we wanted to see. Uh, you know, I, I, it's, it, I don't know, right? But I, I just think that, um, you know, for myself, and, and uh, I still bike. And I bike on one of those polluted roads that you get the little, you know, high, high for bikers, low for drivers things. And I'm, I'm insisting on doing it. I was like, dang it, you're not going to stop me. Um, uh, but um, I just don't know what we could do to nudge people in the right direction. So the question is, is there... Can we shame people? Can we inspire them? You know, I'm, I'm not a, actually it's here at UCSD. You know, there's this uh, persuasive health thing that's going on with BJ Fogg, right? So we all need to go down and talk to him and 
say, how can we persuade people to do the right thing and not, you know. So instead of actual behavior change, if you could just have more triggers to make it easier to do this sort of behavior. Like if you're on Google Maps, it, you will see a low pollution drought or something like that. Sort of oh, yeah. Right. So yeah, there are possibilities because we you have the big picture. You could start suggesting you know alternative routes. That's, that's a good point. Yeah. Yeah, there certainly could be things like that. Um, yeah, and also the t time of day matters for people who can commute at different times. And um, the other one right over thing, sure. Uh, yeah, that would be, and we assume that people would be would be doing that. Some, well, some people did. Yeah. So uh, I think it's it's very clear that users can kind of view uh, their own environment, and you said that they are a lot of them tend to kind of pick out what the sources may be. But is there any way uh, for users to kind of measure what their own impact on the environment is? Like, in this case, biking may be less healthy than, uh, sorry, yeah, less healthy than driving, but is there a way for users to kind of see that their driving is actually contributing to the detriment of others? Yeah, so that's not the, I mean, we can't collect, we, we collect our, the data we collect is sort of aggregate pollution. But the Peer Project has an element of this, which it says, OK, I'm driving a Toyota Corolla in 1989. Um, you know, this is what its catalytic converter operates like. This is what you're driving. With a little bit more data, you know, plug into the data port under the dash. You could say, well, how, how often does this guy slam on the gas and slam on the brakes, which pollutes a lot more than driving gently. So those things are certainly, certainly possible. Um, and, uh, uh, and there's been a lot of research on that. So, I mean, like the Peer Project, there's also a project uh, at the University of Washington, uh, and um, it was Intel and Intel Labs when it was still open there. I forget the name of the project. Um, but they, they, had, they did that, that kind of a thing, and it was meant to inspire people and persuade them to do, to do the right thing. It would basically show, uh, they showed a tree with, that would grow leaves if you were doing things, and the tree would wilt a little bit if you didn't do the right things. It was a, it was a nice, nice, clever idea. You could have the, uh, if I bicycle by your hybrid car, which is low emissions, it could automatically send a thank you note and uh, send a nasty gram to the fellow in the SUV behind you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't think my, I mean, how many Nissan Leafs does it take to offset a Hummer? Yeah, that's a question. Yeah. So, so, but to mention in terms of this, the sort of the actors involved in, in, in the at the social level of individuals and and pol and public policy. Uh, what about the notion of tracking down the sources of these things? Particularly, maybe not so much CO. Really, uh, <coughs> primary source is this distributed, uh, individually owned uh, uh, auto in infrastructure. But say for volatile hydrocarbons and particulates. And you know dioxin derivatives; uh, those are industrial processes. Mm -hmm. What do you see as the possibility of, say, seeding communities that have to live downwind in refinery plumes with periodic emergencies? We see it up in Richmond yeah. every five years. I mean, this this is and this is already hard data, yeah. so that their action can can be well founded and very pointed. Yeah, I mean, this, this is already happening. So this is what happened in San Ysidro, where they recruited the people. They have, they have exposure scientists at CSU. They have these very expensive $50,000 boxes that can mention, capture what are called ultra-fine particulates, which are very expensive to do. So ultra-fine are these particulates that are emitted from uh, uh, natural gas combustion and things like that, because they're natural gas buses. Bad news, ultra-fine particulates are worse than regular particulates, because they directly enter your bloodstream. So now you have little particulates in your blood rather than sticking in your lungs, where you could eventually cough them out. Um, and they're essentially unregulated at this point. Uh, and it's kind of sad. Um, uh, but this is, th this is sort of, you know, I think uh, core of this sort of citizen science, you know, participatory sensing movement, and it's sort of this campaign-based style, which you go out and collect a bunch of data, create visualizations of it, and then you shove it under people's noses and say, look at what you're doing to us. And, um, and it's it's very it's very exciting work because the, the the prices are dropping you know exponentially fast. They're, the battery technologies, the power is lower and lower, and so these things are shrinking fast. You can now make a particulate sensor that uh, normal particulates two point five. Um, it's about as big as this, and has a little fan that sucks air uh, through a, a little filter, and then you measure um, 
I think it's reflectance off of the filter. The reflectance reduces as the pollution builds up. Uh, and, uh, uh, and uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a few grand. It costs money. But uh, it's obviously going to keep dropping. And eventually, we can even put a particulate sensor on this. So it's a really exciting time. And it, this, a lot of this is being fed by the maker uh, movement as well. So Scott just sent me a link. There's a maker event tomorrow, is it, up in San Francisco? Uh, and people are building stuff like this all the time. Because all you need is you know, an Arduino BT and some electrochemical sensors. And OK, calibration's hard. But uh, it's, people are doing cool stuff. It's, I mean, it's really just, um, you know, we're all, all the cool kids are going to be doing it soon. Did you ever find out what was happening at the Triton? Uh, no. So uh, here's my hypothesis. There is a, a bus waiting station on the other side of, the, of this mall where the buses wait before they pull out to the place where the um, uh, the, uh, the, the bus riders, the waiting bus riders get gassed. They probably spend a lot of time idling there when they start up. They, and so that pollution probably comes out the back, floats up to the side of this enormous facade. This, so this Triton is this you know, guy standing like this with water spouting out of him right, right in front of this large facade for the student center. And probably the pollution just pushes up there and just sits there because there's no place for it to go. You know, I think CO is heavier, right? So it's just kind of kind of settle. Uh, there and then it needs you need a breeze or something to kind of get it to dissipate, but it's just a guess. I I, I have no idea. Um, certainly, the ones in front of the bus stop are much much. It's much easier to tell what's going on there. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Right, thank you.